we heard this morning Deborah Meaden saying we need to work in partnership, we need to find a common language, we've talked about collaboration. We've got a big job to do and we can only do it if we bring new people on side. We need to shift opinion about Europe in the UK and I think we probably need to shift opinion about the UK uh, in Europe too. How are we going to do that? And I think this panel is going to tell us some of how we might do that. So welcome to Helen Wales, who's the chair of this panel, and to a fantastic lineup of speakers who are going to talk about how we get beyond our bubbles. So Deborah Mattinson, Peter Kellner, and Femi um, to, talk, to, to talk us through how we might start to shift the conversation on. Dear Hanna, Krusa Afnandar, Higid. It's really great to be here. I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to be chairing such an exciting panel. Um, you probably don't need that much of an introduction to our panellists, but just for formality's sake, we've got Deborah Mattison with us, a former pollster, political advisor, a woman who's made it her business to present voters' views to politicians, and most recently, and I think interestingly for us today, author of Beyond the Red Wall. Uh, we've got Peter Kellner, a journalist, political analyst, um, formerly from Newsnight, um, chair of UGURB, a very vocal and respected political commentator. And then we've got Femi, who I think needs absolutely no explanation to anybody in this audience, um, political activist, co-founder of Our Future, Our Choice, an expert at unpicking the half-truths and the hypocrisy around Brexit and at talking to people who don't agree with him. So, Deborah, shall we kick off um, with you for our opening comments? And we'll have a contribution from each of our panellists, then we'll go to discussion and questions. Great. Thank you very much, Helen. And I, I caught the last talk and it was very uplifting. I fear I may be a little bit less uplifting. And uh, as I talk you through some of the things that I heard for the research that I did for my book, Beyond the Red Wall. Uh, in fact, if you don't want to be um, cast down, perhaps now is the moment to go make a quick cup of tea or something. But otherwise, I'll crack on. I've got five points that I want to make um, about Red Wall voters and their relationship with Brexit. And the first is a sort of really general point. Um, it maybe doesn't need saying, but perhaps it does to a group of people who are prepared to give up their Saturdays to come to a conference like this, which is that most voters in the Red Wall, frankly, most voters everywhere, um, don't follow politics very closely. Um, you know, I've done focus groups where people couldn't name the prime minister. It was David Cameron at the time. Uh, I did a focus group in the last election where somebody said how much they liked Nigel Farage, but then said they didn't think they'd vote for him because they didn't like the Lib Dems very much. So, you know, I think it, you, you actually shouldn't ever underestimate how little people notice. But what they do notice is how different politicians are, the kind of otherness of politics and politicians. And a recent poll that we did at Britain Thinks showed that just 6% agreed that UK politicians understand people like me. And this was particularly true in Red, the Red Wall, where people felt very neglected and that they had not been listened to for a long time. Brexit was a bit of an exception. It stood out. What I found in all of the work that I did was it was the moment where people became quite engaged and excited talking about politics. Huge enthusiasm. Why? Well, and this was even with people who'd voted Remain, the majority, as you'll know, people in the Red Wall didn't. Um, people said they felt it was going to be a circuit breaker. It was going to force a much needed step change. One person said to me, it will shake things up and goodness knows we, we need that. And another said, Brexit was going to be a new start for the whole country and a new start for Oswald Twister, which is where he lived too. So why did they think that? What a lot of people pinned a lot of hope on was the idea of Brexit being an antidote to the many wrongs that they'd been very quick to identify locally, nationally, even internationally, and they had very, very high expectations. So Ken, who was a retired butcher in Accrington, he told me for the first time he felt really optimistic about his grandchildren's future. He said, we used to have the best of engineering, agriculture and fishing, and now that we can set our own rules, we will again. Um, the decline of British manufacturing weighed really, really heavily. He said, you know, this area used to be known for its weaving sheds and now there aren't any. He shook his head really sadly. And when I asked him why this was the EU's fault, he wasn't that sure. But what he did feel sure of was that Brexit offered an opportunity to correct the wrong. And I heard that story again and again 
and again. Another thing that Brexit highlighted was value differences. And I, I suspect a lot of people on this call in this conference will be very familiar with something that stayed with me for a long time, which is a poll that Lord Ashcroft, the Tory peer, published shortly after the referendum, which asked people whether they felt a whole assortment of values, values-led concepts like multiculturalism, feminism, globalism, liberalism, I always call it the ism poll, whether they were a force for good or a force for evil. And the poll literally divided people down the middle by Brexit vote. What we found was that leavers felt strongly that a lot of those isms were a force for ill, quite strong wording, while Remainers felt that they were a force for good, again, quite strong wording. And it's one of the starkest examples I've ever seen of that values divide. But I would say that actually in lots of ways, this was not an ideological battle in people's heads. It was a battle of ordinary working people against the elite. And that was what people told me again and again and again in Redwall. And it reminded me of a focus group that I did just after the referendum, actually not in the Red Wall, um, in, in, in the, the South. Um, one man told me that when he'd woken up the next day to find that we had gone Brexit, as he described it, he, he, he said how he leapt out of bed and he ran round the room, punching the air with joy. He said, I felt like England had won the World Cup. But there was something else going on as well because then the whole group started joining in and agreeing with him. What they had really enjoyed was what they described as sticking two fingers up to them. And when I said, who's them? They said, it was the elites and everybody agreed. Like it was a matter of fact thing. And I heard this again and again and again in the Red Wall where people felt neglected, they felt ignored for decades, they felt judged, they felt looked down on people, particularly people who had voted Remain. Yvonne in Darlington, for instance, told me they started attacking people like me. They said I was ignorant and ill-educated and there was just huge resentment. And I think people felt that this was going to be a corrective. But I've got just one or two minutes. I'll just finish up by saying what has changed since then. One of the things we've done tracking over time at Britain Thinks is to look at how the different groupings, people who voted leave, people who voted remain, have shifted. The most startling thing was that they hardly shifted at all. We saw a little wobble um, around last Christmas when people were fearful that there wouldn't be a deal. My feeling is, and there haven't been that I'm aware of anyway, any polls much more recently, that things will have settled down again. In fact, if anything, I think, with the vaccine war, if you like, um, I suspect that people will now be even more shored up um, with, their, with their sense that leave was the right thing and was forcing a change that the country needed. That's why I leave it there. Thank you, Deborah. I think some important home truths there, which we'll pick up on. Um, can I bring in Peter now? <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. And I want to build on <coughs> what Deborah has just said. I, I read her book. It's a fantastic book, Beyond the Red Wall. And those uh, who haven't read it should buy it, download it, <coughs> or whatever, because it is full of important and salutary truths. Um, the word Brexit... I've come to feel is actually one word meaning two completely different things. It means one thing to the people who promoted Brexit, and I'm going to call that Brexit D, and it means something quite different to the rest of us. So I'm going to call Brexit R. The D stands for dream and the R stands for reality. And the genius, I'm afraid, of the Dominic Cummings campaign, and uh, I would recommend a very long 20,000 word blog he did for The Spectator four years ago, it's online, in which he explains with remarkable candor how they won. And what stands out is he quite explicitly says, we didn't talk about, refused to talk about the reality of Brexit, about the customs union, the single market, uh, frictionless trade, all the actual issues, all the chickens that are now coming home to roost. They talked about money for the NHS, taking back control and the rest of it. They sold a dream and the dream, and this comes back to what Deborah was reporting from her focus groups. The dream was linking um, Brexit to the solution to a problem, which was actually nothing to do with Europe or Brussels or the European Union. It is 30, 40, 50 years of industrial decline which was not arrested, has not been arrested 
by governments of, of either party. And it was the link between the failure of uh, politics to tackle these deep-seated uh, problems of economic change with you know, the, the linking the politics to the uh, inability to change and saying, actually, a large part of the problem is Brussels. So they sort of levered Brussels and the EU into this long-term problem. And that is, in my judgment, why, as, as Deborah has just uh, uh, said, so many people felt a degree of, of liberation because they thought that Brexit was a way of getting back at the political classes. So what does this mean for us now? Well, um, just talking about Brexit, our Brexit reality, in terms of statistics, in terms of foregone GDP, um, in terms of, of um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, this passes most people by, except for the small number directly affected. The same for the, you know, the poor uh, fishing fleets who can't sell their fish into Europe. That affects a small number of people acutely. It doesn't affect the great bulk of it. So I think our basic task is to develop our own narrative in which um, people, as the years roll by, as the problems flowing from Brexit mount, these can be honestly and with evidence related to people's own lives in their own towns, their own jobs, uh, their own um, ability to travel, whatever it is. We've got to build over time a narrative in which, in which the conclusion down the track is Brexit isn't working and there is a better way out of it. But unless we learn the lessons from the way Dominic Cummings operated and see the need for a narrative which combines emotion to personal experience. Look, more than anybody I know, with a possible exception of Deborah, my life has been one of numbers. Uh, I love numbers, but the public don't. And I've long since learned that you can't persuade anybody of anything by talking about percentages and billions of pounds. You've got to talk stories and narratives which people believe because they can relate them to their own lives. Once we can do that and show how that narrative links to a different way of working with Europe, then we have the beginnings of a fight back. Thank you, Peter. And I'm sure, sure many of the people in the audience who have campaigned will identify um, and have had those conversations where you, you agree with 90% of what, what somebody is saying to you. It's just the, the bit, the, the cause of the problem and the solution is the bit that you don't agree on. Um, Femi, um, I think that's a great place to bring you in for your opening remarks. You're, you're muted, Femi. Yeah, so I, I obviously I went around, uh, thank you, I went around um, uh, the country speaking primarily to Leave voters uh, about Brexit over those two years. And um, it was eye-opening. I mean, the whole point was that the, as, as you said, Remainers were, were perceived to be a different species to Leavers. And so I felt it was really important to get out of the bubble. And the, the, the thing that I learned the, the most was um, we speak two different languages on, on, on a lot of things. Often Remainers will, will, will come and speak in these very specific terms about um, uh, solidarity with our European friends, about single market, etc. Whereas Libras will be speaking about sovereignty and the elites, and it was about finding out how to have have a, how to have a conversation where you can meet on common ground. And I think there was a lack, a total lack of empathy between the two sides. So if even even today, if you speak to many Remainers, they, it is beyond our beyond their comprehension as to why someone could possibly have voted Leave, and, and many of it. Is, is much of it is linked to the things that um, that Peter and Deborah were just alluding to there. If you are 50 years old, born in Sunderland, when you were 11 years old, your dad lost his job because Margaret Thatcher closed the shipyards, and you've seen no investment in your area for 40 years, and you've seen London get more get more developed every single year of your life, Millennium Dome, London Eye. When's the last time you saw a tube system, an underground tube system in Hull? You know the system isn't working for you. And so you're going to turn to politics. And what are you going to see in politics? You're going to see that Labour is going to win every single time, no matter what, until now. Um, and you're going to see that your vote doesn't really mean anything because 
um, you're never going to vote Tory, and, the, and they know that. So Labour has no incentive to help you because they know they're always going to win. The Tories have no incentive because they know they're never going to win. So politics has left you behind. And especially under first past the post, your, your vote doesn't really mean anything. And then here comes along the first time that your vote's actually going to make a substantive difference. And the person telling you to vote for status quo is the same person who's put you, you and your family through eight years of austerity. You're going to vote leave. That's just what you're going to do, especially as, and again, Remainers need to understand this, we were not all experts in EU law. We need to be honest and upfront about this. Um, I studied EU law in two universities in two different languages, worked in EU affairs in Brussels and Vienna for three years, and the Northern Irish dimension of this issue, completely beyond me. I was embarrassingly and shamefully ignorant of the issues around Northern Ireland in relation to Brexit. So if even I wasn't informed at the time of that referendum, none of us were. So um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're making a decision in that, in that point, in, in that moment, in that position, in that, with that level of understanding, you're going to be basically thinking, all right, who can I go to to trust? And you're going to turn to the politicians that you trust. So the difference between Libras and Remainers wasn't some innate understanding of EU we chose to trust. Now, obviously, if you're talking, if you're looking at the establishment left and right, they have failed for, very, for a very long time. They have not done anything for those areas that have been left behind. Now, finally, that, and you, you could argue this is the one thing that Brexiteers were very, very right on. They were right that it did shake up the country. They were right that they did now create an arms race between Labour and, and the Tories as to who can do most for those areas that have left, been left behind. Now, both parties are talking about, about um, leveling up. And now we are actually seeing that impetus towards helping those areas. And it, you could argue that it did take a significant shift to get there. Uh, the only question is, is the damage of Brexit going to be so severe that it's going to undo any potential benefits that they could possibly see? And, then, and I believe the answer on that point is yes. As for getting outside the bubble in terms of talking about the damage, um, obviously COVID makes it a bit difficult, difficult, but we do need to be having, having conversations face to face with the people in our lives um, about um, how they feel about Brexit, whether or not it has um, improved things. And there is a very simple way of looking at this. Brexit stalled the country for four years. We did nothing else. So you, you have to ask them, has this been worth it? You've seen what happened with the NHS. You've seen that the NHS's capacity has been the main limiting factor in terms of our ability to cope with this pandemic. You know that if that energy that we spent on Brexit for four years, the time, the resources that were pumped into negotiations, flying to Brussels back and forth, buying port loos and toilets, you know that if that went into, into the NHS, we'd be in a better position. Is what you're seeing now worth it with fishing businesses collapsing, trade collapsing and problems in Northern Ireland? That's the question you need to ask. Thanks, Femi. Um, it strikes me that um, one of the things that we're seeing is, is the UK government, um, Johnson, of course, is what I mean by that, um, trying to sustain the narrative that has got him this far. And to me, it's a, a, a story of gross oversimplification on what are really complex issues. Um, I think the question for us, though, is how do we tell a different story about all of this? How do we make the story one that is not based on I told you so, particularly when the impacts of Brexit that we're all anticipating come home to roost? And um, should we even be talking about Brexit in Europe at this point? Um, Femi, do you want to start off um, in response? Um, so, yes, there, there are elements of I told you so that there are essentially inevitable because you're not going to get 16 million people who all said this will happen to be silent when those things actually happen. Um, but how do you be how do you be productive about this? This is about a addressing the ideology that led to Brexit. Now, it is no historian will ever look at this period and think, oh, we had a group of politicians who all said we could ignore scientific and economic experts. And those same politicians then delivered the worst scientific and economic consequences of the pandemic that then came afterwards and think that that's just a coincidence. If you, if you ignore experts, if you vote people who would tell you they're going to, be, going to ignore experts, you get people who are going to ignore experts and then there are consequences to that. So it ties directly to what we're experiencing right now. Um, not to mention the... Uh, 
suppression of, I had to say, say fascism, but fascism that we're seeing in terms of um, protest, uh, the stuff they've done around limiting what materials can be used in schools, um, and the type of the type of, of freedom restrictions that have been implemented as as a result of of, of this. Um, as for um, having those conversations that are beyond I told you so and how what we can practically do, uh, as you may have heard, the only way out of this, the only way to a more European um, UK, the only way to a better relationship with the EU that isn't driven by people like Boris Johnson is via proportional representation. We have a country that voted that in every election since 2016, the majority has voted for parties that were committed to um, at the very least staying within the EU single market. And ultimately in 2000, 2019, the majority went to parties that were committed to a second referendum between single market and remains, which would have re resulted in remain. So you can point to the fact that because you actually have not as a people taken back control because we still have first past the post, everything that is happening under this government is because votes are not counted equally. Now, if we do get thank to the you, point- Thank you, Femi. I'm gonna right. stop you there because I'm aware of time. Um, right. um, and if you haven't yet seen Femi's video on this on Twitter, do look at it because it's fantastic. Um, but Deborah, what's your response to that question? Like, what's the story that we need to be telling now? The, I mean, the first question is, is, is now the time? And I would say emphatically, no, it isn't. I think there is zero appetite for uh, renewing the debate. And again and again, you know, I've heard not just in the Red Wall, but everywhere, even people who voted Remain, they just wanted it to stop. I mean, get Brexit done was, if anything, an even more brilliant slogan than, uh, you know, than, than uh, take back control. Um, in terms of how to do it when the time is right, I think that what Peter said is, 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 is spot on. It's about building a narrative that is born out of people's experience and, and the timing and phasing of it needs to be born out of them as well, I think, and, the, and you know, the timing that they will wear. And I would say never, ever, 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 ever say, I told you so. It is literally the moment where people clap their hands over their ears and go, la, 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 la. They ask, you know, it's just you have to control people and tell them not to do that. PR, Femi's point, well, I would say good luck with that if you look at that particular referendum. I think there's a bit of a battle to be had there too. Not much appetite for that either, I'm afraid. I feel like I'm being very negative. I think that the moment will come, but I think it has to be judged very carefully and handled very cleverly. Um, Peter. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to agree with Deborah again. Can I just pick up on, on Femi's point on proportional representation? Because I've seen this uh, bubbling up a great deal in the last few weeks in the world of, sort of the anti-Brexit. Um, a, actually, I disagree. Um, I, 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 think, I, I, I think there's a category error in saying that the last general election produced a majority against Brexit. That assumes that, that everybody's vote was determined by the issue of Europe. It, it wasn't. Um, but in any case, we had a referendum 10 years ago on a very marginal form but, that I personally supported, actually. Um, um, and it isn't going to happen. So I, I really wouldn't go there, um, certainly not publicly. You know, uh, people who feel passionately go and join the Electoral Reform Society as well as the European movement and have the debates there. But I think you, know, I think it clutters up our world. Um, but um, but I, I, as Deborah says, this is not the right time to say go back into the EU. We shouldn't be shy about saying that's our objective. But as a campaigning thing, here's my practical suggestion. You know, I, the European movement has this people all over the country, has branches all over the country. Let's assemble the evidence town by town, company by company, shop by shop almost, of things going wrong with Brexit in people's own lives, people's own communities, own jobs. And let's develop a, as it were, a victims of Brexit narrative. What we, what we ought to be aiming for two or three years down the track is a, a majority of people saying, Brexit's going badly and I'm feeling it. Mm. And if we can build up week by week the information, the practical information that contributes to that perception, um, then I think we have a fair chance two, three, three, four years down the track when we get towards the you know, manifestos of the Labour Party in the next election and so on, then we can make some progress 
But that's the basis on which I think we need to build medium term. You've preempted my final question, Peter, which is what should we be doing um, right now? Um, so Deborah and Peter both talking about holding back almost, keeping quiet, yet we have this, this network of people willing to give up their Saturday because they believe so passionately in this cause. Um, Deborah, what is the one thing you think we as a movement should be doing now, or even what should we not be doing? Well, I mean, what we should not be doing, I think is what I've just said, never say I told you so whatever you do even with uh, I mean I, I'm very taken actually with what Peter's just said about the victims of I think that's a great idea I think it needs to be done carefully if they want to if, if you know if your activists want to find something to do I think there are lots of other useful things they could be doing in the meantime by the way uh, but if they want to do something that's Europe related then actually going out and researching that and finding and talking to people and gathering their stories could be a very good way of going but you know don't then start shouting about it and saying well of course we always knew that would happen that is the worst thing that you could do and Femi what's what's the one thing you think we should all be doing right now um pressuring sorry I've got to come back to, to PR because unless you have a um a government that's willing to do it the Tories are not going to take us back into the EU the Tories are never going to take take us into the single market it goes against everything they they, they stand for um, and Labour is is so isn't trusted enough on 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 it to deliver this by themselves. So it requires an electoral pact. So convincing Labour to to, to switch to an electoral pact based on electoral reform is the only way we get to actually concretely get to. Even if we've got the people to that place, we won't get the, the politicians to that place unless we get that um, pro progressive progressive alliance. And as for um, whether or not um, people are towards towards staying in the EU. The polls are showing that, that most people think they would vote to re vote to remain. And if all, regardless of what their motivations, if all votes had counted equally, the majority of MPs would have been second referendum parties, and we would still be in the EU today. Thank you. Um, differences of opinion, I think, are inevitable. This is not a conversation that's going to to end anytime soon. But I, I think what we're hearing really clearly, though, is there is a difference between working on the public as um, to working politically and we need to be mindful of both those things. Um, to finish off, um, I just wanted to add that I am part of a small group of activists working across um, organisations in the wider European movement on a project which is very much about telling a new story about Europe what we need to learn, how we construct a new narrative and how we put that out there. Um, it's very much supported by European movement as well as others. And we will be launching that with a debate on in the week of the 10th of May. If you're interested in that, keep an eye out on communications from your usual channels. Um, so for today, I think the only thing left for me to say is a huge thank you or diolch an fawr to um, Deborah, to Peter and to Femi and to European Movement for hosting today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, the hardest thing about today is that I think we could listen to lots of these contributions for much longer than we've got on the programme for them. Um, but I, as, as Helen says, that is a conversation that we will continue to be having about how we get our message right, how we time it right, how we understand our audience better so that we can tell the stories we need to tell 